Well, go to me the Mogov. Tell me, Han says to Skiaf the Moor, Marsha, Akoil, and Octogus, when I do it dirty, will be dirty or Agome, sort of says, question of August Fragrica. At the volume, Desperoctianu, Talan question, or Tana Fragrica, and Shin, Neil Shade and Shaw are in the. When I finish these remarks, uh, obviously people can ask questions, but I've found increasingly as we do these meetings that the answers are in the rooms. There's enough experience, enough wit, enough intelligence, enough wisdom in the people down there to find the answers to any of the questions you might uh, raise. So I would prefer to see us having a, a discussion about how we continue to move forward. And, and be sure of this. The reason why there's a tsunami, is that Bob's story? Did you escape? <laughs> anyway, the point that was making, that the reason why there's such a tsunami of smear and uh, agitation by the elites against Sinn Féin is because of our growing strength. And, and Deirdre alluded to this when she talked about the awakening. And, and there has been an awakening. And it's been a, a good way coming. And it actually reminds me a wee bit of what happened here in the late 60s. Because anybody of my age will remember that the first stand for civil rights, you know, if, if you look back at the old black and white footage, you'll see thousands or tens of thousands or scores of thousands of people on the streets. But it wasn't like that at the beginning. It was a very, very, very small number of people, mostly women. It was Bridget Bond up in, up in Derry. It was Mrs. McCluskey. It was Mrs. Gildenew down in uh, Culloden. It was old Barney McFadden. It was small groups of people, ones and twos and threes, uh, about the place who were, who were standing against discrimination in housing or against the Special Powers Act or for the right to vote and, and so on. But then something happened and the rest famously is history. Well people in, in, in the part of the, the, the island that I now serve have had eight years of austerity and before that revelations of corruption and of all sorts of really dastardly deeds by the elites and by the fat cats and by some politicians. And for whatever reason, this water charges issue just seems to have touched a nerve. And it's organic. Now we, we all know people here who are activists. We, we know how to organize, we know how to protest, we know how to put together a, a crowd. This is happening spontaneously. And the other thing that's coming into people's uh, vision more and more, and this is particularly the case for, for young people who have not been taught their history, is the notion that we're going to celebrate the centenary of the 1916 Rising. And myself and, and Jennifer McCann were in the GPO, not in 1916, but last, <laughs> but about a week ago. And, and the government unveiled its plans. And it was, it was quite, uh, it was like a Sean Casey play because they had, those of you who have been in the GPO, there's this big room, this big lovely looking room and they had it all dickied up. But there were about 60 or 70 or 100 water protesters outside. And every so often the sounds of the ministerial speeches, which were very self-serving, were drowned out by the, the, the shouts and the, the yells and the chants of the rebels who were protesting against the water charges. Then the other thing they did, they put, they put together a video. And the video, I don't know if any of you have seen it. I, I tweeted it if any of you didn't see it. it. It doesn't have the proclamation on it. It doesn't have the leaders on it. It has Bono. It has Google. It has David Cameron, it has Martin McGuinness's friend, Queen Elizabeth. <laughs> but no mention of the rising. 
no mention of the proclamation and that's not an accident because the government is in opposition to the social and economic intent of that wonderful democratic declaration by people who declared a republic in the streets of Dublin. They also have a section in it in Gaelga. But where did they get the Irish language translation? They went to Google Translate. And any of you who ever go to Google Translate, it's gibberish. So, so that's, that's the government's uh, look at the rising and all what it involved. And people are now comparing what we have in the island and the type of society which we have in the southern part of the island because a lot of the focus in our lifetimes has been on the Orange State and on the north. But a very conservative state was established in the south, a very narrow, inward-looking, insular, conservative right-wing state was established down in the 26 counties. And in the last eight years, this is something that I, I've never got my head around, half a million people in eight years, out of a population of less than five million, have been forced to emigrate. It's a huge amount of people, and I travel a lot in rural areas and into the west and do meetings like this. You don't see it in Dublin, and maybe you don't see it in Dundalk or in Cork. You go into any of the, the, the rural western seaboard, the absence of young people, the absence of bright young people is so obvious, and the, the societal and the communal damage as well as the damage that's been done to families is an indictment of successive Irish governments. Now having said all of that, and tonight I'm working from a script, and there's not an expletive on it, I, I do want to return to the theme that I addressed in, in Enniskillen. Uh, and my, my mistake, of course, was to use a swear word. And for that I have said, mea culpa. And for Gregory, that's not Irish, that's Latin. <laughs> and I, I do accept that many people have been offended by my use of a swear word, but sometimes even when something is said in an inappropriate way, it can spark off something which is positive and something which provokes a good debate. And it's my strong hope that that just might be the case if we keep pushing at these issues. It's also my strong view that we need to face up to. It's the elephant in the room. We need to face up to bigotry. We need to face up to racism, to, I suppose, the whole scourge of homophobia and to misogamy. And earlier this evening, on my way up from, from Dublin, I, I looked up the definition of a bigot on the website dictionary.com. And it described a bigot as a person who is utterly intolerant of any differing creed, belief, or opinion. And I would on to say, the bigot is like the pupil of the eye. The more light you put upon it, the more it will contract. And that, that took my fancy because my understanding of that is that the more you shine a light on bigotry, the more you'll force it to contract. So, first thing to do is to look in the mirror. Start with ourselves. Republicanism by its very nature cannot be intolerant of any differing creeds or beliefs or opinions. Of course, we can disagree with people. Of course, we should be intolerant of poverty, of injustice, of inequality, of bigotry. But we have to uphold the right to religious and political freedom. In other words, we must defend the right of citizens to have different creeds or beliefs or opinions. Because republicanism is essentially about the empowerment of people. It's about the empowerment of citizens. It's about citizenship. It's about a citizen-based, rights-centered society. It's about equality. It's about solidarity. And it's about freedom. So anyone who, who expresses sectarian or racist or homophobic or misogynist views has no place in Republican ranks. But then how do we deal with, with bigots within wider society? 
And how do we deal with sectarianism? The northern state is a sectarian state. That's the basis on which it was established. And when unionism was in control, it abused the institutions of the state and it used its political power to sustain itself. One unionist prime minister put it very well. A Protestant parliament for a Protestant people. And Catholics were the main targets of this sectarianism and the main victims of state policies of discrimination. Because essentially, you see, what sectarianism is, is it a vice to keep people in their place. And nationalists here in North Belfast know this. But we should also know that sectarianism also keeps working class Protestants in their place. It, it divides them from us, it divides them from their Catholic neighbours, it makes them distrustful even though in many cases, particularly for poor working class people, living conditions are exactly the same. So that's, that's what sectarianism is for. It's, it's an artificial device to divide and to conquer. And because this is a sectarian state, and because unionism could not be trusted to govern fairly, the outcomes of the Good Friday Agreement and the St. Andrews Agreement and all the other agreements are all Ireland. We made it very, very clear, and John Hume joined with me in declaring this very, very energetically, that there could be no internal settlement. So all the institutions and all the other protocols are all Ireland in nature. And there's also many equality and other legal safeguards built into this new political dispensation. And these include compulsory power sharing and partnership. And thinking unionism knows this. Thinking unionism knows that this will be the case for as long as this new dispensation lasts. And I'm sure any, any of our MLS will tell you this, that fair-minded unionist MLS have come to terms with this. They accept that reality and they fulfill their duties in a positive way. And they also appreciate the more long-headed ones that these safeguards are for their advantage as well and for their protection as the constitutional position changes in the time ahead. Now there are others both inside the assembly and outside it who toy with the idea that the system of governance can be changed back to the old ways. And you know, the truth of it is that that is never ever going to happen. The truth is also that the new political dispensation will deliver for everyone only when all the political parties enter into the spirit as well as the letter of power sharing. And the bigots, when we get to that point, won't like that. But they will contract, like the pupil, they will contract as a result. Any suggestion that the compulsory nature of power sharing arrangements can be changed is dishonest and it's misleading and that's the reality and those who may argue this position know that it's unattainable and any politician whatever he or she represents or whatever party or non-party that they come from anyone with a real interest in the future which is would be one that would embrace everyone must set their faces against sectarianism we the people in this room should be the most anti-sectarian of all. There is a political framework, there is governing principles, there is a means to facilitate the conduct of politics and the coexistence of these competing political traditions and aspirations. That's there. But of course it has to be worked at. And it's been the failure, not least of the failure of the two governments, to fully embrace and promote the principles of mutual respect, of parity of esteem, of equality, of the right to live free from sectarian harassment and to pursue political goals through peaceful means. That all means that the culture of sectarianism retards the primacy of democratic politics. And the fact also is for as long as the attitudes and the agents of sectarianism and segregation 
remain unchallenged. As long as that remains unchallenged, division and polarization will be perpetuated and intolerance, a lack of respect and bigotry will continue and the potential for instability will remain. And the culture, let's face up to this, the culture and the practice of sectarianism in this city that we live in, it's one of the most segregated cities in the world. It's here all around us. That will remain. And it does remain. And it's endemic socially and politically. And it's not a working class phenomenon. It may be more obvious in, in poor and disadvantaged areas. But sectarianism, it influences our approach to education, to educational preferences, it influences our choice of sport, it, it influences where we live, it influences how we socialize and sometimes where we socialize, and to some degree where we get employment if we're lucky enough to have a job. And in my view, the vast majority of people don't want to live like that. The vast majority of people want their children or their grandchildren to live free of all of that. And I, I had two interesting experiences with two people, two young people, who I bumped into uh, in Dublin. They're, they're both from Republican families. And they both gave me the same answer when I asked them what it was like to live in Dublin. He said, you don't have to worry what street you're in. The very difference to their lives, which lots of people here have not been able to have in your lifetimes. So sectarianism demeans everyone. It cannot be tolerated and it must be eradicated. And there is an urgent need. The British government set its face against this and the unionists have been opposed to it as well. But there is a need for a Bill of Rights. A need for a Bill of Rights which copper fastens the entitlement of citizens to live free from all forms of sectarian harassment, bigotry and intolerance. And we also should be thinking along the lines of taking best international practice in terms of informing the entrenchment of a legal definition of sectarianism and bringing about anti-sectarian legislation including robust provisions to deal with incitement to hatred. See there are racists and bigots in every society but most other societies deal with it. They deal with it. Whatever you're doing in the privacy of your own home, that's fair enough. But you come out publicly and incite racial or other hatred, you're up in court. You're in trouble. And therefore, in that way, it's for you, Bob. <laughs> and that way, the vast majority of citizens get on with their lives, and that issue is uh, tackled and, and addressed. We have also been listening to some good citizens from both the unionist and the broadly nationalist uh, constituencies who have been talking about trying to get a citizen's anti-sectarian charter. Something that everybody could sign up to. Something that wouldn't be the property of the politicians or the elite. Something that could be started on the ground that people from working class, loyalist, unionist, republican, nationalist communities could be a part of. And if, if we were able to get that kick started, the people in civic society, the people in the trade union movement, the people within the community sector could kick start that process, that could actually re energize politics here and open up a new phase. So these different models that I have just outlined briefly should be the focus of all the parties. They should be part of the talks. Are they part of the talks? No, they're not part of the talks. But as the talks intensify in the period ahead, it is our intention to put all of these issues on the agenda. Because the bigots can't be allowed to win. That's not the will of the people. Sinn Féin are the problem solvers, and the will of the people is to live in an inclusive, tolerant, peaceful, future for everyone. Go to meet